Welcome. This is the Middle Grade Gets Real panel, um, and I'm the moderator. My name is Ali Condi. My most recent middle grade novel is called The Torchbearers. It's a series written with Brendan Reichs. I am here, and that's pretty much all you're going to hear about me. So <laughs> I'm here with three amazing authors, and they are going to introduce their books a little bit more in just a second, but right now I'll take the chance to introduce them individually. So Case and Callender, and their most recent book is King and the Dragonflies. Kaysen was born and raised in St. Thomas at the U.S. Virgin Islands. They are a best-selling and award-winning author of the middle grade novels Hurricane Child and King and the Dragonflies, the young adult novels This is Kind of an Epic Love Story and Felix Ever After, and the adult novel Queen of the Conquer and its forthcoming sequel King of the Rising. King and the Dragonflies is a National Book Award finalist in the category of young adult literature. They enjoy playing RPG video games in their free time, and Kaysen currently resides in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Our next author is Brandy Colbert. Brandy is the award-winning author of several books for children and teens, including The Voting Booth, The Only Black Girls in Town, The Revolution of Bertie Randolph, and Stonewall Book Award winner Little and Lion. She is the co-writer of Misty Copeland's Life in Motion Young Readers Edition, and her short fiction and essays have been published in a variety of critically acclaimed anthologies for young people. Her books have been chosen as Junior Library Guild selections and have appeared on many best of lists, including the American Library Association's Best Fiction for Young Adults and Quick Picks for Reluctant Young Adult Readers. She's on faculty at Hamlin. Is it Hamlin or Hamline? I never say that it's, right, Brandy. Yeah, it's Hamlin. You got it right. <laughs> okay. okay. I shouldn't have given that away. <laughs> Hamlin University's <laughs> MFA in writing for children and lives in Los Angeles. Next up, we have Erin Entrada Kelly, and her most recent book for middle grade is We Dream of Space. Erin received the 2018 Newbery Medal for Hello Universe, the 2017 AP ALA Award for the Land of Forgotten Girls, and the 2016 Golden Kite Honor Award for Blackbird Fly, among other honors. She is a New York Times bestseller whose work has been translated into several languages. Her fifth book and first, first fantasy, Leilani of the Distant Sea, received six star reviews and was named one of the best books of the year by the New York Public Library, The Horn Book, Book List, Book Page, and others. Her sixth book, We Dream of Space, is her first work of historical fiction. It's set in January 1986 in the weeks leading to the Challenger disaster. And I want to apologize, I don't usually read that directly from the bios, but there was no way around it, people. They and did you hear that list of awards? Like there was on everyone's behalf, everyone had very specific, very amazing awards, and I didn't want to get any of those wrong. Um, but Kaysen, you're very modest because I had to go in and add the National Book Award finalist part to your bio because I knew that had happened. And I was like, where is that on the website? So <laughs> congratulations on that. That just happened recently, and those are awarded this month. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Well, that's pretty, I mean, all of these awards are quite amazing, but that one's happening right now, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of launch into some questions, but this is a round table. I'd love you guys to jump in, or if one question leads to another, let's go with the flow. Let's let's have this be kind of natural. Um, but I, And then we'll have a few lightning rounds at the end. Um, Actually, maybe let's do a couple of those first to warm us up. And we also have some time for audience Q&A. So if you're in the audience, um, I think you know how to submit those and we'll do that a bit at the end. Um, so just a couple of lightning round first, um, and I will answer these just to give you time to think. But I always like to ask people, so what's the thing that lights you up? Like, what is the thing that you can talk about that's not yourself? that is your favorite thing to talk about? Like if I ask you what question or about what person or thing, what will you just go on and on and on about? So I'll start while you're thinking. I never get asked about, Allie, like the question I never get asked that I really wish I had is, Allie, have you ever met Michael Phelps? And <laughs> I have met Michael Phelps. The picture of me and my two children with him. But the thing that kind of lights me up that I like to talk about is the Olympics and sports. And I think I find it super fascinating, both as a former athlete, not a very good one, but also as um, a writer, like the story arcs are so interesting on, um, on TV, whenever NBC is bringing it up, I'm like, I don't think I cared about curling, but I've watched eight hours and I know everybody's backstory. <laughs> um, and I find the narrative really fascinating too, because 
we are pushing people to limits that they shouldn't really have to go to. And I think that's part of why I like the Michael Phelps story so much is that it feels very human. Um, so that's kind of a thing I could go on and on about clearly, but let's turn that over to you and you guys can jump in, whatever. What's the thing that I could ask you about and you would potentially go on for hours? Um, I can start. Uh, you know, I think it's food, which is like kind of a strange thing. But, um, you know, like I'm really into I don't have cable, but when I did or do, you know, I love watching shows on Food Network and cooking the cooking channel. And then I wondered why I was so obsessed with those sort of like in my 20s. I started thinking about that. And then I remember that I used to watch all those old cooking shows on PBS uh, that were on like in the eighties when I was a little kid, like I would just sit down with a notebook and write in front of the TV and watch cooking shows. And I don't know what it is. Like I'm actually a very picky eater and I'm a vegetarian. So <laughs> I'm really kind of a nightmare to go to dinner with, but um, I really love all types of food and I love to watch people like eat and cook food that I would never eat. So I don't know, it's a strange thing, but I love it. And I could talk about and watch, you know, people cooking food forever. So Brandy, do you feel like fine watching people cook food that you don't eat? What if they're cooking meat or you seem healthy? Do you still will you watch the Great British Baking Show with all the cakes? Yeah, I just, I don't know what it is. I love it. Like I, if you, you know, in any of my books, like my agent is always like, there's so much food in here. Like you might want to pull back. Like this isn't a book about food, but I just love writing about it. I love writing like anything. I especially love writing about things I don't eat. So I feel like there's like, in a past life, I was a super adventurous eater and must have eaten everything because like, I'm just so interested in all of it. But like when it comes down to it, I really don't actually eat that much besides vegetables and fish. So, I love that. That's I so wonder some, oh, go ahead, Erin. I was just gonna say that's so interesting because I've noticed that about your books. Like there, there's always like a meal or someone's cooking <laughs> and I'm like, I'm into it though. Right. I like, I'm, I'm like, this is interesting. I've been meaning to yeah. ask you about that. That comes through. Um, I'm glad I'll tell my agent. She'll feel very validated in her critiques <laughs> of my books. <laughs> well, so much happens around food. You know what I mean? Like family life and friendships and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's pretty, so. <clears throat> excuse me. It's pretty cultural too. So I just think it's really interesting and there's so much to like dig into there with food. So yeah, I'm glad you noticed. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. I sometimes wonder too if part of the reason I like those shows so much is it almost feels like you're being cared for, like they're baking the food for you or, you know, even like they've made you the meal, even though they haven't. And I feel like that's something in your books too, Brandy, as you're, as Aaron oh. was noticing that just reading about the meal, you feel a little bit taken care of too. Oh, that's good. Well, I'll never stop writing about food, guys. It's going to be in everything. So, <laughs> um, yeah, for me, I think um, I've become very obsessed with uh, spirituality and with healing and with like inner child healing, meditation, yoga, that sort of thing. I've been kind of just watching a lot on YouTube and listening to podcasts, basically nonstop. So. That's what I could go on and on about. Well, don't yeah. stop there. Like, tell us a little, what should we be listening to or watching? If if you had one thing to, I know it's a big um, one. No, I mean, the thing I would really love to say has a bad word in it. So I have to turn for myself. <laughs> but there's a <laughs> podcast by a woman named Olia and it's called Spiritual SH. You know what the rest of the word would be. I don't want to take it past <laughs> PG-13, but... Um, yeah, she is such an incredible uh, guide and just kind of helping people understand what their um, past traumas might be and how to heal from them and how to grow from them and how we as adults can um, be influenced by those traumas and how they can affect our relationships and attachment styles and just everything. And I, I really, really love her. And there's so much more on YouTube that I feel like you could just go down like the rabbit hole and just never stop. I think it's interesting also that we're right in middle grade because I think that that goes back to um, the inner child for a lot of us and why a lot of adults are uh, drawn to reading middle grade and a lot of older readers is probably because it reflects a lot of their old childhood traumas that they need to heal from. Thank you. So I think, I think mine would be um, Unsolved Mysteries. Like I'm Ooh. very much into... Um, unsolved mysteries of all kinds. I kind of have a, a very morbid side. Um, so I also like history, like 
like, um, you know, twisted history, you know, like how, how, like medical care in the middle ages, like things like that interests me. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really into that. I, like I recently read a book called, uh, the poisoner's handbook and it's all about, uh, poison and the different types of poisons that people used back in the day. So I have like a weird fascination with that, but I also love unsolved mysteries. Like, you know, when I was a little kid, I watched the show with Robert Stack and I would just sit there and my heart would be thumping in my chest, you know, with the intro. Cause it was always like kind of scary. And from that point forward, I've just been interested in, in all kinds of unsolved mysteries. Yeah, I, I never got past the intro. Oh, sorry. Go on, Allie. Oh, did you get too nervous? Were you, did you? Yeah, I got too nervous. Just like, gonna... like the music was just like terrifying. I always had to turn it was It was scary. Did you watch... it, it was. Did you watch the, or do you watch the one on Netflix? The new yes. version? Or... And it's so good. It's so good. So there's okay. a lot of podcasts I listen to that are, surround unsolved mysteries like astonishing legends is one um but i'm just you know i'm really into it i also i haven't seen the new one either brandy but i was a little too scared of the other one but i love how when aaron you were told me i read the i like torture in the middle ages or poisoner's handbook every the, i was watching the other two of you and you're both like yeah <laughs> for sure so we're, all kind of, we're into that kind of thing all right, so we'll leave that one and go to a few more of the questions that are more about the book. So, Kason, I wanted to start with you because your book has an absolutely beautiful opening line, and I'm going to read it, <laughs> but it says, so the opening line of Kason's book, King and the Dragonflies, is, the dragonflies live down by the bayou, but there's no way to know which one's my brother. And that... Um, that's a pretty stunning opening line. Um, and so I was thinking about that, how not only does that draw the reader in the book, but it sets, sets up the plot and the characters in just a few words. Um, so I would like, I have two kind of questions for you and then we can take these wider if they apply. But I was wondering how you came up with that line. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get a pass, you get an easy one because you've been doing all the work inside and something just comes out. Sometimes you spend a lot of time on it. And then I also wanted to talk about how some of the most poignant moments of your book are what I would call remembering moments. Um, and I'm, I'm trying really hard not to spoil or anything, but there's a lot of moments, a couple in particular I'm thinking of where the main character is wanting to talk to, again, trying not to spoil anything, someone and then realizing they are gone. And those moments were pretty, pretty beautiful and pretty painful in the book um, because I think we've all had those moments where we wanna talk to someone or we wanna do something and that's no longer an option. So two questions, one about the opening line and then another about those remembering moments. If you could speak to those however you feel, that would be great. Um, yeah, the opening line was one of those rare lines that I believe that that was just the first line I wrote and it stayed the yeah. same. Um, and I'm sure, I'm curious to hear what your experiences are with writing because I feel like for me, the process can change from book to book, but this book really just kind of like whooshed out of me. And I think um, a lot of us have those experiences sometimes where we're not even really thinking about like, oh, I have to do this and I have to like tie this to this plot there. And I have, you know, it's not very um, mechanical, but just kind of like very instinctive. So that was really my experience with this book. Um, and with the first line, and I'm trying to think of, yeah, with the question with memory, um, I'm not really sure what else to say besides kind of what my first answer to the question about what we're excited about is, because I think that that has so much to do with kind of remembering trauma and having to kind of like integrate that trauma into your current self, if that makes any sense, and how yeah. that is a part of the healing process. So for King, um, I think it's okay to say that his brother has passed away. That is said within the, yeah, I think that that's, um, basically in the premise of the book, but his brother has passed away and that is his first like initial wound. Um, and goodness, I have ADHD, so my mind tends to like go off in a zillion different directions, but I'm thinking also about how um, wounds tend to be catalysts for, like the first wound tends to be the catalyst for middle grade age readers, um, because you tend to be at an age where you haven't had so many wounds yet. And for like my YA and adult novels, for example, you have, um, multiple wounds that the uh, main character has to heal from. 
for King and for like Caroline for my other middle grade book. Um, these are their first wounds, their first moments of like real pain where Caroline has like lost her mother and King has lost his brother. So that's like the catalyst for the entire book. And that means that the entire book becomes like this thread of having to heal from the first wound that they've experienced. I don't know if any of that answers what you were trying to say, but. <laughs> no, it absolutely does. And I loved the way you described that first line and then by extension, the book, one of those whoosh experiences when you said that and made that gesture, I thought like, it, it seemed like there was a sense of relief maybe in, not that you're not writing about hard things or but in your relief in getting that book out. So I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I want to, but I, I think that's a great way to take, to go forward too. Have you guys, Aaron and Brandy, have you ever had a whoosh book where it kind of did just come out like, like Kaysen was describing? I think for me, I, you know, sometimes whenever that first sentence uh, <clears throat> comes in my brain, kind of speaking to the first sentence, sometimes that can trigger the, the whoosh moment, you know, I think it depends, for me, it depends on the day, it depends on like the scene and kind of depends on a lot of different things. But sometimes there's the, the whoosh moment, we're just going to make that a thing. Um, and then sometimes <laughs> there's some days it's harder, you know, and I think, like Kaysen said, each book is very different. But one thing that uh, Kaysen said that remind that made me think is, um, you know, at this age, they're kind of experiencing first wounds. And I don't know if if either of you feel this way or any of you. But, you know, sometimes when you go speak to kids, I think about that and you look at them, you know, and you're let's say you're speaking to a, fi a room full of fifth graders and there's a part of you as an adult who knows like all these years ahead of them that feels kind of like that pain for them. You know, you feel joy for them mm -hmm. that they're out in the world, but then you know that the world is gonna hurt them and no one, no one escapes from that. I mean, some more than others, there's just no way around it. And you kind of just wanna like take them all and put them in this bubble, but that's kind of also what inspires us to write, you know, is to, to be able to, we can't put a bubble around them and we shouldn't want to, but we, we want to, but we can't. But then these books kind of give them, um, at least the way I, I, I think of it, and I'm sure all of us do, is, is like a way to navigate those wounds. So when they do get to the second one and the third one and the 10th one and the 15th one, they have something to help them, you know, through it, if that makes sense. And if I can jump in, I also, um, oh, I'm sorry, Brandy, I just wanted to say quickly, I also, um, or Ali, um, yeah, the what you were saying also remind me of ancestral wounds and the fact that you know even being born into this world as a black person is just like an immediate wound because you are immediately going to deal with racism and some you know we don't need to go into um, I don't want to uh, trigger anyone but talking about for example like a lot of the things that black women have to deal with giving birth in hospitals just basic things like that, that I think um, even as babies we still have to kind of heal from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also, I mean, I don't, I, yeah, I don't have anything that's, that was also smart. I have nothing to add to that, but I totally agree with both of what both of you were saying. And Erin, I'm thinking of, like, I had my first school visit this week, um, virtual, of course, with um, younger kids, because this is my first middle grade book. And yeah, I had that feeling where I just like almost wanted to cry when I saw them because I was like, you're so young and sweet. And like, I'm sure plenty of them have all already had, you know, those wounds um, because, you know, some people get a harder deal in life than others, but just looking at them overall, just talking to them and seeing how excited they were. And it, it's just, it's so special, you know, not to get too like sappy, but it just really reminds you of why we write and why we write what we write. Um, Cause it really does, I think, help them kind of emerge into the world. I love everything all of you guys have said. And I think that's true. I mean, you do go to schools and I've been doing middle grade for a few years as well. And you know, some of those kids have already been hurt and you know that there has been pain prior to this, but it's sort of like the more life you live, the more hurt you will get just because that's the way it is maybe, but there's also the more healing you will have too. And so maybe what we're also trying to show them uh, to speak to Kaysen's original point too, is, is how to heal. Uh, maybe that's mm -hmm. also what we're trying to give them equipment for as well. So mm -hmm. um, some of, I think some of us better than others. I feel like um, you read my book and I, I, you guys are all very profound. So that's why I'm moderating and you're talking. <laughs> um, but I think that one of the things I also wanted to talk about 
about um, another kind of moment comes up in um, Aaron's book. And I wanted, I don't, I'm not going to assume how old anyone was, but I was around for the actual event of the Challenger um, explosion. I don't know if anyone else was, but we were set up at school watching it in second grade because there was a teacher going to space. It was Krista McAuliffe, who you put in the, in the very beginning. She's the little quote at the, at the opener, Aaron. Um, and so we experienced kind of, it wasn't, no one in my school anyway had anyone on that flight, but we experienced this sort of collective trauma where we were watching the first teacher go into space as a school. And then it happened right in front of our eyes live. And Aaron, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, like the, I was in second grade. I assume you might've been around, but I don't know. Um, did you experience that moment live? Um, how did you come to write about that? Um, can you just I did, tell I didn't, Sure, I didn't experience it live because our school didn't have the setup, but I was around, I was in fourth grade and it's kind of the first major news event of my childhood that I really remember. And I think what's really interesting about the Challenger disaster is it's at the kind of at the beginning of the 24 hour news cycle and uh, those images were replayed so yeah. much. And I think I mean, it definitely has resonance to today where things are just replayed over and over and people are and there's not a lot of thought, I feel like, to how it's affecting people who are exposed to a traumatic event constantly. And this was the, the, the Challenger disaster was kind of the first of this, you know, ongoing lifetime that we have of events being replayed and replayed and replayed over mm -hmm. and over. And, um, you know, it just left such an indelible mark, I think, especially for young people, because a teacher was on board. And that's something that young people, you know, when you're young, your teacher is like, you know, otherworldly, right? You see your teacher at the grocery store and you're like, what? You, you don't live at school? You know, <laughs> so it's like <laughs> teachers are such an important part of our childhood. So, um, I think that resonated on a unique level with a lot of young people. And the fact that so many young people watched it live um, and the fact that it was played over and over and over again. And, you know, there's been studies and articles about how um, these kinds of things, how the 24 hour news cycle has, has harmed a lot of people by replaying traumatic events. Um, I'm sure we have, you know, definitely relevant to today, uh, just over and over again. And you're just constantly exposed to it. So I think uh, for that, for all those reasons, it kind of just stuck with me. And I knew that I wanted to write about it at some point. Yeah, I think what you're saying is, is really powerful about trauma shown over and over and over again, and particularly, well, always, I guess, but this last year, I feel like there have been a lot of images shown, maybe even without permission, that have been people dying. People, you know, and we're watching that. Um, and I think that's, yeah, I appreciate that you said that because I think that is a more global implication even then. I mean, that was sort of a contained and that was just the beginning of what kids are exposed to now. And I think about how powerfully that affected me. So many levels removed from it. And then there's these other things happening that are not. They're within people's communities. They're within uh, people's neighborhoods sometimes even that they're watching play out because now we all have cell phones. So um, for better or for worse, sometimes those are helpful. Um, and so I think one I wanna... thing that happens too, I want to say really quickly, is like whenever whenever these images are shown again and again, I think the the people who are affected start to become the the image and not a person anymore. And that's another thing that I wanted to really think about with the book. Like you, you see it so much, you get desensitized to it, and you forget those were actual human beings and loved ones who died. You know, and I think that's another harmful effect of you know, those kinds of things. That, I, yeah. And I think that that brings me to the question I wanted to throw to you, Erin, and then to the other panelists as well. Um, I don't want this to have to be sad or hard, but it definitely, those are important things. So either way, what is a where were you moment that you've had in your life, whether you heard some good news or some hard news or something big happened? In, wide, wide out in the world or something small that happened um, to you, or not small, but something that happened to you personally? Where What's a where were you moment that you can think of or come up with? Um, I, I know oh. like, we were watching the election and um, I and finally the results came in on Saturday and I've got four kids 
and I, they were listening to Kamala Harris and um, Joe Biden speak. And my 12 year old who was eight at the last election looked at me and said, I'm always going to remember the last one because it was bad. And I'll always remember this one because it felt good. And I thought, Oh, you know, he was having this kind of where he was moment um, right then. But so I was just killing time there. <laughs> so if any of you no, I th so. Yes. No, I think that's a, that's a perfect analogy, right? Cause in November, 2016, I, I stopped watching at some point and just wept, you know, like many people. And actually this last one, uh, Wednesday, I could not get out of bed. I just stayed in bed, you know, and, and cried because we didn't know what was going to happen. And I was like, I don't, you know, um, so, but, you know, for an uplifting one, of course, I'm going to say when I found out about the Newberry medal, right, I was stuck in traffic and I was going to work because they had the wrong number. So just, we'll, we'll, we're bringing on an upswing. I was stuck in traffic because I, I worked in the city at the time in Philadelphia and I got the call and it was like 30 minutes before the announcements were going to be made because I didn't have my right, correct phone number. So that's obviously a moment that I'll always remember. And then I immediately called out of work and turned around and drove right back home. <laughs> I like that you get home that day. I think you get a pass. Okay, so Randy, what about you? Hmm. I guess I keep thinking since you brought up the election and thinking about, um, I've written about this before in essays, but um, Obama's uh, first election, um, you know, I feel like Obama is sort of, uh, I'm losing my word here, but, you know, he wasn't a perfect president, um, but of course he was <laughs> much better than what we've had for the last four years. Um, but, you know, it meant a lot to see uh, the first black person be, you know, elected president. And so I was actually living in Chicago then. And, oh, yeah. you know, there was a huge celebration. Yeah, I know. But of course me, there was like a huge celebration, you know, downtown and I'm just like at home alone under the covers, like watching from my bed, uh, just watching it on TV. And, you know, I kind of like, it's, it's been that same feeling since then, since 2008, just like feeling this hope, but also feeling like, is everyone going to do the right thing here? You know? Um, and then actually being, incredibly shocked when that happened. And like, I let out this noise that I've never heard before then. I never heard after that before. It was just like the strangled kind of cry, like of like happiness and surprise and just shock, like all at once. And I was just so like, all these emotions went through me. So it was, that was like really, really special. And, you know, I don't consider myself super into politics or anything, but that was probably the most exciting moment in politics that I think has happened in my life. Um, you know, my answer was, uh, my initial answer was probably going to bring down the mood, but I think, you know, we've spoken so much about trauma, it is equally important, if not more, to keep it with like the joy. So I'm not even going to give my answer. I just like the oh, feeling right now of like all this joy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if you think of something later, feel free to say, I, I remembered some joy that I would like to now <laughs> put out there. Um, <laughs> Brandy's, I have a question for Brandy also that I'm going to throw to you guys as well about the only black girls in town. And so there's this passage where Edie, one of the characters, the main characters, talks about um, New York and how she used to live there. And she says, um, I love New York like it's family. It's home. I miss it. And I hate when people say stupid things about it. People who've never even been there and only seen it in gangster movies. People can be really rude around here, I say. A lot of them haven't even been out of the state or even the area. They don't know any better. That's what dad tells me sometimes when I complain about the things people at school have said to me. It doesn't usually make me feel much better though. I don't feel any better saying it to Edie either. And what's the excuse for someone like Nicolette? She and her family go on a huge trip to Europe every summer and it's like she has a bag full of stupid things that she's just waiting to whip out at any moment. Um, and I loved this. I loved everything about this because it felt like, um, I think that's that's one of the things we say, right? Like travel will change you and you will see new beginnings and um, it will make you more accepting and all of those things. And so I wanted to ask you about that, Brandy. Like, have you had any of those? Ex travel will let you do what it will, what you will let it do, right? And so, um, and, and, and anyone else too, like, can you, is there something you were thinking of when you wrote that? Um, like people who profess to be so worldly and 
or any experience you want to share with travel in general too, because I think that is, I think we've all probably had those experiences where you're like, I'm totally experiencing this. And then realize kind of not, you know, so I, I don't know. <laughs> have a light bulb moment while you were, while you were traveling, because those are very real too. So. Yeah, no, I love that you pulled out that passage. Um, you know, I was thinking of certain friends I have, like kind of long-term friends that I've known since, you know, high school or college um, who travel all the time. And they sort of, and these are white friends, and they sort of, um, they sort of present travel. Traveling is like a personality trait. Like, you know, like, oh, I traveled, like I'm so well-traveled. Like it makes them a different person when in fact, like I've heard them say some of the most closed-minded things, you know, that I've heard are straight up offensive things or racist things or sexist things. Like, and so that always really struck me as funny because, you know, I'm not very well-traveled. In fact, um, you know, I've only been out of the country once and that was to Mexico. And I, I'm kind of shocked myself, you know, I'm 41 years old. Um, I was really assumed I would have been more well-traveled by now, but I feel like I really try very hard to understand other people and other cultures and just, anything that's different from me, anyone who's different from me. I think I try really hard to listen to them and understand and try to sort of get into their head and see what they're experiencing and, you know, just empathy really. Um, so I was just thinking about that a lot because it just seems like so many people I know who have had these experiences that I haven't had, don't really take the time to actually get to know people on that level, you know, when they're at home, um, just living their everyday lives. Aaron or Kaysen, any thoughts on that or, or any trips you want to tell us about? <laughs> I mean, I will say that I, I think that, that I definitely understand what, what, what Brandy's saying is, is where like, I think some people travel and they see themselves as, um, you know, I, I, I'm here in, in your place, welcome me. And then there's people who travel who are like, I'm a guest right, in your, in your space. And, um, you know, it, there's a different mindset, I think, that is behind it. But one thing that's, that really has uh, resonated with me as I've traveled is, you know, I go to, like last year, I, was, I went to Germany, and I had all these worries, like, I don't speak German. W what if, what if this, what if that? And one thing that always fascinates me is, the kids have the same questions like you know we're we're all different but we're also all the same and i think that's what's so fascinating about travel wherever you go there's there's people who love their children there's kids who want to play there's uh you know there's just we're all the same but we're all different that's what's so great about traveling cuz you get to appreciate both of those things so like any worry that i usually have had about oh i'm going to this different culture and and it's going to be weird or I'm not going to know what to do or it, it, it's always like pointless. You know, it's like wasted worry mm -hmm. because it turns out that we're all pretty similar. We all have kind of the same. We all have hopes and dreams and fears and uh, people we love, people we don't love, all that stuff. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I was just thinking about um, before everything that's happened for 2020. Uh, I was just so afraid to travel, but now that everything has happened, I've been stuck inside, I've realized that that is going to be my main priority once things have hopefully changed enough. Like I just want to um, spend all of my time traveling and kind of like going back to what Brandy was saying. Also um, making sure I'm not traveling with like what I would call the colonizer mindset, like kind of like <laughs> making sure I know <laughs> people's <laughs> histories and um, making sure that I'm not doing something in unintentionally harmful for uh, that culture or, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I'm very excited to finally get out of this apartment and just <laughs> get to as many different countries as possible. Yeah. Let's hold each other accountable, Kaysen, because I really want to travel when this is like, I was planning to go to Europe this year and then of course this yeah. happened. So let's hold each other accountable and get out there and travel after this is over. It's a deal. <laughs> That made me think of when I took a, a, a different kid to London when he was 10 and it was the first time he'd been anywhere and he loved it. He loved everything about it. We did a bunch of different stuff, but then we were flying home and I said, what did you think about London? And he said, it was kind of scary because I realized that nothing I believe is true. And I thought, well, that wasn't my intent you know, <laughs> to rock your world. <laughs> but I think sometimes you do feel that you travel and you realize, oh, nothing I believed is true. And that actually kind of feels amazing. It's scary too, but 
So everybody will will hold each other accountable, but you two especially. <laughs> I want to hear where everyone goes. <laughs> Twitter. Yes, definitely. Um, do you have one question I want to ask you guys, but I think we'll throw it to the audience for a little bit. Um, so we have we have a lot of questions coming in for you. Um, and here's one that's kind of interesting uh, that I think you guys will speak really well to. It says, um, so Philip Colvin said, there are some things, some subjects too large for adult fiction. They can only be dealt with adequately in a children's book. And this question was from Alexa Kuo. And so she's, or Kuo. And she said, thoughts, how do you tackle those really hard topics without getting too dark for the age group? I'm sure because I have written middle grade too, that you guys have been asked this question 1 million times. So to paraphrase that, do you think there's anything too dark? For a children's book, I really, really, um, I think when someone says that things are too dark for children, um, they are coming in with the intention or with the um, mindset that the children that they know in their life or something that they have experienced have been very privileged and have not had to experience a lot of different pains that so many of us had. Um, I'm not gonna give too many details, obviously. I don't think y'all wanna know about my life story that much, but my first traumas were when I was six. And I know that there's so many people that have experienced very many dark and painful traumas um, from the time that they were born, as I was kind of saying earlier. So I don't think it's possible to be too dark for children. But for me, um, even as was kind of like briefly mentioned before, for me, the answer is always making sure it's kind of balanced with joy and balanced with hope and balanced with the understanding because, um, since we are writing for children, I do think that in many cases, younger readers have not necessarily lived enough years to understand that there are cycles. So for me, when I was younger, I didn't understand that there's a cycle of pain to joy and pain to love and pain to light. I just thought it was just going to be darkness for the rest of my life. So I do take that with um, a lot of responsibility and making sure that I show that there are cycles in my work so that younger readers can understand it's not going to be forever. And I, I want to kind of leap off of that because I recently read Kaysen's Hurricane Child and you know I've been like fanning over it so much. And one of the things that I loved about it is one one topic that that I don't see a lot of in middle grade and I think the reason is because it's it's very difficult to manage is suicidal ideation. And there's some of that in um, Hurricane Child and it was so beautifully done in such a way that I don't want to embarrass you, Casey, but it's just so, it was so beautifully done and responsibly done. And I think that that's really difficult to do with, with suicidal ideation. And I had my first suicide attempt when I was 11. So I think there's people out there who think that, that nobody's thinking about that at 10 or 11, and it's just not true. And we need books out there where that kind of address it, but it is a very tough thing to do because at that age, um, they don't see, like Kaysen was saying, they don't see the cycles. And so you have to be very careful about how you address it to let them know, cause, cause they have no concept of time. You know what I mean? Like kids, like, oh, this is forever. So <clears throat> I feel like that's a topic that, that I think we need more of very carefully. And I think another thing that we don't see a lot of in middle grade is religion handled in, mm -hmm. in interesting or different ways. And I think, because again, I think that's another thing that's kind of difficult and that's not to say neither of those are too dark because nothing's too dark for middle grade, but those are the first two things that come to mind. Yeah, I said, definitely. Oh, sorry, Brandy. It does feel like no, no, they, no. Think they can't, it's hard for them to see, like it does feel like forever because a year is forever. You know, that's such a large percentage of their life. It's hard to see how you'll come out of that. And so when you're showing them that they can, that's, that feels very hopeful. Sorry, Brandy, what were you going No, on? no, that's, that's so true. And I agree with everything um, that you both said. And I, yeah, I don't think there's anything too dark. And I think also it's really helpful for both groups of kids, right? Like sort of the mirrors and windows that Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop talks about, um, you know, because I grew up quite sheltered, you know, in a small sort of smallish town in, you know, Missouri, um, didn't really see, you know, lived in a very safe town, didn't really see a lot of crime or, and I lived in a very, um, 
you know, stable household. My parents got divorced, but it was still very stable. Um, and realizing the older I get, how very stable and how very sheltered I sort of was. Like the main trauma in my life was racism, which is, you know, not to <laughs> gloss over that. It's a very big trauma um, and, and had some experiences from a young age with that. But, you know, reading books at that time about kids who were going through things I couldn't even imagine was really helpful to me. Um, again, going back to empathy, it helped me really understand that like my life, even though it was presented as like, you know, normal in all kinds of media at the time, um, that it wasn't really that normal and that kids were going through a lot of difficult things that I couldn't even imagine. So I just think it's really useful to put that out there and to just have that space for readers who are experiencing that and then also readers who are not experiencing that and don't understand it firsthand. I think that's a perfect, yeah, a perfect conclusion to that. Because I think sometimes parents, and like Kaysen was saying, like particularly privileged parents, the parents of privileged children, are saying, well, I don't want them to read about that because then they'll think about that or they'll do that or if they're reading about suicidal ideation. But like Brandy said, it'll either, they maybe they aren't and it will help with empathy or maybe they are and they're so alone. And so that's, I feel like that's a really important balance to strike too with you either need empathy or you need to feel less alone so where's the problem like either way either way kids should be reading those books um mm -hmm. so to kind of end it on a joyful note taking i'm kind of taking a cue from case in here i feel like can you guys maybe speak to one or, or talk about one or two things that's just bringing you joy right now because for anyone who is watching we're all experiencing a pandemic we're all experiencing a transition that is much rockier than it should be politically um, we're all probably also experiencing some joy in some different ways. And I think what the pandemic may have done for us is teach us how to find small joys because, and no one else is responsible for them because we're now alone in our apartments or wherever part of the time. Um, so is there anything that I just bought a, like five super cuddly blankets from Target. And every time I find a kid, they're lying in one of those blankets. So um, I not sponsored by Target, but there are some really good blankets there right now. Cheap and shipped will bring it to you. Um, but is there anything you guys have been finding a lot of joy in in these hard times, these hard and hopeful times? I've started to um, collect crystals, so I have some crystals here beside me, and I just like their energy. They're just really pretty. So, small joys. My answer is super Aaron. boring because it's books. I mean, <laughs> yeah. books, I, you know, I've just, I've been reading a lot and I think people are either not reading at all or reading a ton and I'm kind of on the, the other side of where I'm just reading a lot, you know, so that's not a very, it's not a very original answer because we're writers and we're at a book thing, but that's my answer. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Answer, I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was almost going to say that, but then I was like, I don't know, I felt the same way. So I'm glad you said it because books are also bringing me um, a lot of joy. But I'm going to go sort of similar storytelling TV. Like I've always loved television. Like I was a kid who thankfully was also a big reader because my parents did not monitor my television really at all. Um, it was on all the time. It's still on quite a bit. Um, and I've sort of been getting into um, more genre. Like I realized that it's not that I don't necessarily like, um, you know, horror or, um, you know, science fiction uh, fantasy. It's that like, there really typically weren't black people or, you know, any people of color in these, or if they were, they were getting killed off within the first five minutes of the first episode or whatever. And now, you know, there's shows like Watchmen and Lovecraft County, which has its own issues, but, um, you know, really, they had a lot of quite pro problematic things in there, but they did do some things right, too. And just seeing, you know, my own people on the screen in these stories that I had never really experienced um, is really has been bringing me a lot of joy, too. Well, I think we are right at time here. Um, and you guys are the perfect panelists in every way, including ending at 45 minutes on the dot. Um, but I wanted to thank you. And um, this is that's a great conversation. I wish we could keep going. You're probably all ready to move on to other things, but um, I feel like this was such a, yeah, this was a very powerful conversation from three very, very smart human beings, very good human beings. I feel like that was coming through the screen as well. Um, and so I want to thank you guys for your time. I want to remind everyone that these, there are three really beautiful books out there for you to find comfort in and also learn from. Um, so anyone who is, is having 
the need of something beautiful to read or wonderful to read during, during this time of comfort, then there you go. <laughs> that is my actual pitch, not the target one I accidentally did earlier. <laughs> Thank well, you. thank you so much, Allie. We really appreciated the thoughtful questions and conversation. Thank oh, you. Wonderful to meet and re-meet all of you. And thank you so much. <laughs>